Section One of A Rubaiyat Miscellany. Recording by Algie Pug. Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam by Edward Fitzgerald. Author's final revision with the literal Omar, being a version of those quatrains of the original upon which Fitzgerald's poem was based. Edited by Arthur Guiterman, with eight illustrations by Gilbert James. Paul Elder and Company. Publishers, San Francisco, 1909 The Preface About the middle of the 11th century, perhaps a dozen years before the Battle of Hastings, Omar Khayyam, or, to give him his full title, Giyas Uddin Abu Fah Omar in Ibrahim al Khayyam, was born in the city of Naishapur, in the province of Khorasan, in the ancient and somewhat decadent kingdom of Persia. Omar's surname, Khayyam, meaning tent-maker, descended to him from his father, and the theory that he ever practised his paternal or ancestral calling is hardly countenanced by the poet's own whimsical allusion to his name in the oft-quoted quatrain. Khayyam, who stitched the tents of learning, falling into grief's furnace, lies burned to ashes. The knife of fate hath cut the tent-ropes of his life, and the broker of hope hath sold him for a song. Though there are conflicting opinions, it is popularly accepted that Omar was educated in his native city at the school of a renowned priest and teacher, the Imam Moafek, in fellowship and sworn brotherhood with two schoolmates, who were destined to figure prominently in the annals of their time. The first of these was Hassan ibn Ali, later known as the Nizam-ul-Mulk, that is, Regulator of the State, or Vizier to the Sultan Ap Ashlan and Malik Shah. The other was Hassan ben Sabah, afterwards infamous as the Sheikh al-Jabal, or Old Man of the Mountains, of the Crusaders, founder and chief of that terrible sect, the Assassins. The three boys mutually vowed that whichever one of them should attain to power would share his good fortune with the others. So it was that when Hassan ibn Ali became chief administrator of the state, he offered Omar the governorship of Naishapur and the adjacent districts. The poet, however, had no political ambitions, and desired only the means to enable him to pursue his scientific researches without care for the morrow. His friend, therefore, granted him a substantial pension, in the enjoyment of which he spent his remaining days at Naishapur, occupied with the study of the sciences, especially mathematics and astronomy. He was greatly honoured by Sultan Malik Shah, and was one of the eight scientists employed by that ruler in the important work of reforming the Mohammedan calendar, a task that he and his associates performed with great success. He was the author of various mathematical, astronomical, and meteorological pamphlets and tables of high repute, and there are extant quaint stories which exalt him as an astrologer and weather prophet of parts. Although the narrators of these tales admit that Omar himself placed small faith in forecasts of future events. Indeed, several incidents make it appear that Omar had a far keener sense of humour than most of his contemporaries and was not above a joke at the expense of the literal mind. He died in A.D. 1123, and was buried near the wall of the cemetery of Naishapur, where the extended boughs of the fruit trees in an adjoining garden, blossoming at different seasons, repeatedly covered his tomb with heaps of their dropped flowers, thus fulfilling his prophecy, recorded by a loving pupil, My grave will be in a spot where the trees will shed their blossoms on me twice a year. There are said to be, in various known manuscripts, about twelve hundred rubaiyat or quatrains ascribed to Omar, though many of these are admittedly spurious, some having evidently been interpolated by scribes or scholars to voice their dissent from the poet's heretical views. Each rubai is really a distinct poem. In the Persian manuscripts, the quatrains are grouped alphabetically, that is, according to the terminal letters of the rhymed lines and with no reference to their meaning or subject. Fitzgerald, in his beautiful version, besides selecting, combining, and marvellously retouching such rubaiyat as appealed to his genius, arranged them so as to produce an effect of continuity of thought 
wholly lacking in the originals. Interpreted literally or allegorically, Omar has been diversely credited with every possible form of belief and unbelief, but the old astronomer took himself far less seriously than many of his commentators take him, and themselves. His was a period of a great religious unrest in the Mohammedan world, with much wrangling of the two and seventy jarring sects, each blissfully assured of the eternal damnation of all the others. And it is easy to believe that he took a sly delight in shocking the dogmatists, partly by voicing directly heterodox views, often by carrying their own doctrines to unforeseen yet logical conclusions. Moreover, his verses, the diversions of a mathematician thrown off at widely separated times, embody temporary moods and impressions as frequently as seated convictions. That he had convictions is hardly to be doubted. He could be serious and devout, as well as mocking and cynical. But each reader will inevitably interpret the delightfully inconsistent old Persian according to his individual lights, moods and fancies. Among the less-known literary remains of the many-sided astronomer is the following quaint little dialogue between himself and reason, in which he reveals his very human, very modern personality far more distinctly than in many of the better-known Rubaiyat. Omar and Reason Old Reason dined with me, a seldom guest. We passed a pleasant noon in idle jest. Said I, Thou, fount of knowledge, pray impart the truth of many things that vex my heart. First, tell me, what is life when rightly weighed? Asleep, said he, with dreams that glow and fade. And canst thou name the fruits thereof, I said? He nodded, sundry aches of heart and head. Then, what is marriage, next I sought to know? An hour's joy, he scoffed and years of woe. Define, said I, the breed that preys on me. A pack of jackals, wolves, and dogs, growled he. Can aught subdue the soul of man, I cried. The world hath whips, quoth he, and chains beside. What works are old Kayams, I asked betimes. False figuring, he laughed, and crazy rhymes. Anything is to be expected of the mathematician and poet whose philosophy had in it enough of the spice of humour to enable him thus to laugh at his own work. Edward Fitzgerald, to whom the English-speaking world owes its delight in Omar, was born March the 31st, 1809, in the White House, a fine old English mansion in Suffolk. He was the third son of John Purcell, a wealthy Irish doctor, who in 1818 assumed the name Fitzgerald, which was that of his wife, she having inherited her father's large estate. The future revivifier of Omar was educated at King Edward's School in Bury St Edmunds and at Trinity College, Cambridge. After his graduation in 1830, he passed a life of pleasant, easy-going literary dilettantism in the enjoyment of a moderate but sufficient income, always, in the words of his friend Carlyle, a lonely, shy, kind-hearted man. He married, November the 4th, 1856, Lucy Barton, daughter of his friend Bernard Barton, the Quaker poet, seemingly because he had promised her dying father to care for her. But his retiring eccentric nature was anything but adapted to married life, and in about six months the ill-mated pair quietly separated to live happily ever after. Fitzgerald's later years were chiefly spent on his farm at Little Grange near Woodbridge. He died June 13th, 1883. Although his miscellaneous writings and translations lack the enduring qualities of his one great poem, they are not unworthy of a man whom Thackeray and Tennyson delighted to call their friend. The first edition of Fitzgerald's version of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam of Naishapur containing 75 quatrains, was issued in pamphlet form February 15th, 1859, at five shillings, but was sold out at a penny a copy, attracting no attention save in purely literary circles. This edition was reprinted by Bernard Quaritch in 1862. A second edition, containing 110 quatrains, was issued in 1868, 
to be followed by a third and a fourth, each of a hundred and one quatrains in 1872 and 1879. Fitzgerald's version is far more than a mere translation. It is a masterly adaptation, a work of original genius based on the selected quatrains of the Persian poet, presenting many of his most striking thoughts and expressions in the purest English verse. Though some phases of Omar's mentality are not represented, the Persian, as a poet, has hardly suffered at the hands of the Englishman. How well Fitzgerald did his work may be gathered from a comparison of his stanzas with the translations of the quatrains of Omar upon which they were mainly based, printed elsewhere in this volume. End of Section 1 Section 2 of A Rubaiyat Miscellany Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam Wake! For the sun who scattered into flight the stars before him from the field of night, drives night along with them from heaven, and strikes the sultan's turret with a shaft of light. Before the phantom of false morning died, methought a voice within a tavern cried, When all the temple is prepared within, why nods the drowsy worshipper outside? And as the cock crew, those who stood before the tavern shouted, Open then the door, you know how little while we have to stay, and once departed, may return no more. Now, the new year reviving old desires, the thoughtful soul to solitude retires, where the white hand of Moses on the bow puts out, and Jesus from the ground suspires. Iram, indeed, is gone with all his rose, and Jamshid's seven-ringed cup, where no one knows. But still a ruby kindles in the vine, and many a garden by the water blows. And David's lips are locked, but in divine high-piping Pelevi, with wine, 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 red wine. The nightingale cries to the rose, that sallow cheek of hers to incarnadine. Come, fill the cup, and in the fire of spring your winter garment of repentance fling. The bird of time has but a little way to flutter, and the bird is on the wing. Whether at Neshapur or Babylon, whether the cup with sweet or bitter run, the wine of life keeps oozing drop by drop. The leaves of life keep falling one by one. Each morn a thousand roses brings, you say. Yes, but where leaves the rose of yesterday? And this first summer month that brings the rose shall take Jamshid and Kaiko Bud away. Well, let it take them. What have we to do with Kaikobad the Great, or Kaikosru? Let Zal and Rustam bluster as they will, or Hatim call to supper. Heed not you. With me along the strip of herbage strown that just divides the desert from the sown, where name of slave and sultan is forgot, and peace to Mahmud on his golden throne. A book of verses underneath the bough, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou beside me, singing in the wilderness, O oh, wilderness were paradise enow. Some for the glories of this world, and some sigh for the prophet's paradise to come. Ah, take the cash, and let the credit go, nor heed the rumble of a distant drum. Look to the blowing rose about us. Lo, laughing, she says, into the world I blow, at once the silken tassel of my purse tear, and its treasure on the garden throw. And those who husbanded the golden grain, and those who flung it to the winds like rain, alike to no such orate earth are turned as, buried once, men want dug up again. The worldly hope men set their hearts upon turns ashes, or it prospers, and anon 
like snow upon the desert's dusty face, lighting a little hour or two, is gone. Think, in this battered caravanserai, whose portals are alternate night and day, how sultan after sultan with his pomp abode his destined hour, and went his way. They say the lion and the lizard keep the courts where Jamshid gloried and drank deep, and Bahram, that great hunter, the wild ass stamps o'er his head, but cannot break his sleep. I sometimes think that never blows so red the rose as where some buried Caesar bled, that every hyacinth the garden wears dropped in her lap from some once lovely head. And this reviving herb, whose tender green, Fledges the river lip on which we lean. Ah, lean upon it lightly, For who knows from what once lovely lip It springs unseen. Ah, my beloved, fill the cup that clears Today of past regrets and future fears. Tomorrow, why, tomorrow I may be myself With yesterday's seven thousand years. For some we loved, the loveliest, and the best, That from his vintage rolling time hath pressed, Have drunk their cup a round or two before, And one by one crept silently to rest. And we, that now make merry in the room they left, And summer dresses in new bloom, Ourselves must we beneath the couch of earth descend, Ourselves to make a couch. For whom? Ah, make the most of what we yet may spend Before we too into the dust descend, Dust into dust, and under dust to lie, Sans wine, sans song, sans singer, and sans end. Alike for those who for today prepare, And those that after some tomorrow stare, A muezzin from the tower of darkness cries, Fools! Your reward is neither here nor there. Why, all the saints and sages who discussed of the two worlds so wisely, they are thrust like foolish prophets forth, their words to scorn are scattered, and their mouths are stopped with dust. Myself, when young, did eagerly frequent doctor and saint, and heard great argument about it and about but evermore came out by the same door wherein I went. With them the seed of wisdom did I sow, and with mine own hand wrought to make it grow, and this was all the harvest that I reaped. I came like water, and like wind I go. Into this universe, and why not knowing, nor whence, like water willy-nilly flowing, and out of it, as wind along the waste, I know not whither, willy-nilly blowing. What, without asking, hither hurried whence? And, without asking, whither hurried hence? Oh, many a cup of this forbidden wine Must drown the memory of that insolence. Up from earth's centre, through the seventh gate I rose, And on the throne of Saturn sate, and many a knot unravelled by the road, but not the master knot of human fate. There was the door to which I found no key, there was the veil through which I might not see. Some little talk a while of me and thee there was, and then no more of thee and me. Earth could not answer, nor the seas that mourn in flowing purple of their lord forlorn, nor rolling heaven with all his signs revealed and hidden by the sleeve of night and morn. Then of the thee in me who works behind the veil, I lifted up my hands to find a lamp amid the darkness, and I heard, as from without, the me within me blind. Then to the lip of this poor earthen urn I leaned, the secret of my life to learn, and lip to lip it murmured, While you live, drink, for once dead, 
you never shall return. I think the vessel that with fugitive articulation answered once did live and drink, and, ah, the passive lip I kissed, how many kisses might it take and give? For I remember, stopping by the way, to watch a potter thumping his wet clay, and with its all obliterated tongue it murmured, Gently, brother, gently, pray. And has not such a story from of old Down man's successive generations rolled Of such a clod of saturated earth Cast by the maker into human mould? And not a drop that from our cups we throw For earth to drink of, but may steal below To quench the fire of anguish in some eye There hidden, far beneath, and long ago. As then the tulip for her morning sup Of heavenly vintage from the soil looks up, Do you devoutly do the like, Till heaven to earth in virtue, like an empty cup? Perplexed no more with human or divine, Tomorrow's tangle to the winds resign, And lose your fingers in the tresses Of the cypress slender minister of wine. And if the wine you drink, the lip you press, End in what all begins and ends in? Yes. Think then you are today what yesterday you were. Tomorrow you shall not be less. So when that angel of the darker drink At last shall find you by the river brink, And, offering his cup, Invite your soul forth to your lips to quaff, You shall not shrink. Why, if the soul can fling the dust aside, and naked on the air of heaven ride, were it not a shame, were it not a shame for him in this clay carcass crippled to abide? Tis but a tent where takes his one day's rest, a sultan to the realm of death addressed. The sultan rises, and the dark farash strikes, and prepares it for another guest. And fear not less existence, closing your account, and mine, should know the like no more. The eternal sake from that bowl has poured millions of bubbles like us, and will pour. When you and I behind the veil are past, oh, but the long, long while the world shall last, which of our coming and departing heeds as the sea's self should heed a pebble cast. A moment's halt, a momentary taste of being from the well amid the waste. And lo, the phantom caravan has reached the nothing it set out from. Oh, make haste! Would you that spangle of existence spend about the secret? Quick, about it, friend! A hair perhaps divides the false and true. And upon what, prithee, may life depend? A hair, perhaps, divides the false and true. Yes, and a single alif were the clue, could you but find it. To the treasure house, and peradventure to the master, too. Whose secret presence, through creation's veins, running quicksilver-like, eludes your pains, taking all shapes from mah to mahi, and they change and perish all. But he remains. A moment guessed, then back behind the fold, immersed of darkness round the drama rolled, which, for the pastime of eternity, he doth himself contrive, enact, behold. But if in vain, down on the stubborn floor of earth, and up to heaven's unopening door, you gaze today while you are you, how then tomorrow you when shall be you no more? Waste not your hour, nor in a vain pursuit of this and that endeavour and dispute. Better be jocund with a fruitful grape than sadden after none or bitter fruit. You know, my friends, with what a brave carouse I made a second marriage in my house, divorced old barren reason from my bed, and took the daughter of the vine to spouse. For is and is not Though with rule and line, and up and down by logic I define, 
Of all that one should care to fathom, I was never deep in anything but wine. Ah, but my computations, people say, reduce the year to better reckoning. Nay, t'was only striking from the calendar, unborn to-morrow, and dead yesterday. And lately, by the tavern door agape, came shining through the dusk an angel's shape, bearing a vessel on his shoulder. And he bid me taste of it, and t'was the grape. The grape, that can with logic absolute the two and seventy jarring sects confute, the sovereign alchemist, that in a trice life's leaden metal into gold transmute. The mighty Mahmud, Allah breathing Lord, that all the misbelieving and black horde of fears and sorrows that infest the soul, scatters before him with his whirlwind sword. Why, be this juice the growth of God, who dare blaspheme the twisted tendril as a snare? A blessing, we should use it, should we not? And if a curse, why then, who set it there? I must abjure the balm of life, I must, scared by some after-reckoning, tain on trust, or lured with hope of some diviner drink to fill the cup when crumbled into dust. O oh, threats of hell and hopes of paradise! One thing at least is certain, this life flies. One thing is certain, and the rest is lies. The flower that once has blown forever dies. Strange, is it not, that of the myriads who before us passed the door of darkness through, not one returns to tell us of the road which to discover we must travel to? The revelations of devout and learned who rose before us, and as prophets burned, are all but stories which, awoke from sleep, they told their comrades, and to sleep returned. I sent my soul through the invisible some letter of that afterlife to spell, and by and by my soul returned to me and answered, I myself am heaven and hell. Heaven but the vision of fulfilled desire, And hell the shadow from a soul on fire, Cast on the darkness into which ourselves, So late emerged from, shall so soon expire. We are no other than a moving row Of magic shadow shapes that come and go, Round with a sun-illumined lantern Held in midnight by the master of the show. But helpless pieces of the game he plays Upon this checkerboard of nights and days, Hither and thither moves, and checks, and slays, And one by one back in the closet lays. The ball no question makes of eyes and a nose, But here or there a strikes the player goes, And he that tossed you down into the field, He knows about it all, he knows, he knows. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on. Nor all your piety, nor wit, shall lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all your tears wash out a word of it. And that inverted bowl they call the sky, where under crawling, cooped, we live and die. Lift not your hands to it for help, for it as impotently moves as you or I. With earth's first clay they did the last man need, and there of the last harvest sowed the seed, and the first morning of creation wrote what the last dawn of reckoning shall read. Yesterday this day's madness did prepare, tomorrow's silence, triumph, or despair. Drink! For you know not whence you came, nor why. Drink, for you know not why you go, nor where. I tell you this, when, started from the goal, Over the flaming shoulders of the foal of heaven, Pawan and Mushtari they flung, In my predestined plot of dust and soul. The vine had struck a fibre, Which about if clings my being. Let the dervish flout, 
of my base metal may be filed a key that shall unlock the door he howls without. And this I know, whether the one true light kindle to love, or wrath, consume me quite, one flash of it within the tavern court better than in the temple lost outright. What? Out of senseless nothing to provoke a conscious something, to resent the yoke of unpermitted pleasure, under pain of everlasting penalties if broke? What? From his helpless creature be repaid pure gold for what he lent him dross allayed? Sue for a debt he never did contract, and cannot answer, O oh, the sorry trade! O oh, thou, who didst with pitfall, and with gin, Beset the road I was to wander in, Thou wilt not with predestined evil round in mesh, And then impute my fall to sin. O oh, thou, who man of baser earth didst make, And even with paradise devise the snake, for all the sin wherewith the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. As under cover of departing day slunk hunger-stricken Ramazan away, once more within the potter's house alone I stood, surrounded by the shapes of clay. Shapes of all sorts and sizes, great and small, that stood along the floor and by the wall, and some loquacious vessels were, and some listened perhaps, but never talked at all. Said one among them, Surely not in vain my substance of the common earth was ta'en, and to this figure moulded to be broke, or trampled back to shapeless earth again. Then said a second, Now a peevish boy would break the bowl from which he drank in joy, and he that with his hand the vessel made was surely not in after wrath destroy. After a momentary silence spake some vessel of a more ungainly make. I sneer at me for leaning all awry. What, did the hand in a pot a shake? Whereat some one of the loquacious lot, I think a Sufi pipkin waxing hot. All this of pot and potter, tell me then, who is a potter, pray, and who the pot? Why, said another, some there be who tell of one who threatens he will toss to hell the luckless pots he married in making. Pish, he's a good fellow, and will all be well. Well, murmured one, let whoso make or buy, my clay with long oblivion is gone dry. But filming with the old familiar juice, Methinks I might recover by and by. So while the vessels one by one were speaking, The little moon looked in that all were seeking, And then they jogged each other, Brother, brother, now for the porter's shoulder knot a creaking. Ah, with the grape my fading life provide, And wash the body whence the life has died and lay me shrouded in the living leaf by some not unfrequented garden-side, that eved my buried ashes such a snare of vintage shall fling up into the air as not a true believer passing by, but shall be overtaken unaware. Indeed, the idols I have loved so long have done my credit in this world much wrong, have drowned my glory in a shallow cup, and sold my reputation for a song. Indeed, indeed, repentance oft before I swore, but was I sober when I swore? And then, and then came spring, and rose in hand, my threadbare penitence a pieces tore. And much as wine has played the infidel, and robbed me of my robe of honour, well, I wonder often what the vintners buy, one half so precious as the stuff they sell. Yet, ah, that spring should vanish with the rose, that youth's sweet-scented manuscript should close, the nightingale that in the branches sang, ah, whence and whither flown again, who knows? Would but the desert of the fountain yield one glimpse, 
if dimly yet indeed revealed to which the fainting traveller might spring as springs the trampled herbage of the field would but some winged angel ere too late arrest the yet unfolded roll of fate and make the stern recorder otherwise in register or quite obliterate ah love could you and i with him conspire to grasp this sorry scheme of things entire would not we shatter it to bits and then remould it nearer to the heart's desire yon rising moon that looks for us again how oft hereafter will she wax and wane how oft hereafter rising look for us through this same garden and for one in vain and when like her osaki you shall pass among the guests star scattered on the grass and in your joyous errand reach the spot where i made one turn down an empty glass tamam end of section two section three of a rubaiyat miscellany the literal omar the following selected quatrains of the original rubaiyat are those upon which the greater version of edward fitzgerald was mainly based in order to facilitate comparison the stanzas are numbered to correspond with those in fitzgerald's version for which they furnished the inspiration where two quatrains in the paraphrase bear the same number both supplied material for the fitzgerald stanza that is similarly numbered thus fitzgerald's stanza nine contains ideas from nine and nine a of the paraphrase conversely the quatrain in the paraphrase bearing the numbers forty nine and fifty was used by fitzgerald in constructing his two stanzas forty nine and fifty to give the general reader the true sense of omar as developed by many scholarly translators and commentators has been the main purpose and the lines of the paraphrase have been arranged so as to present the old persian's ideas as intelligibly and forcefully as possible it need hardly be added that fitzgerald utilized ideas and figures from miscellaneous quatrains of omar that are not cited he may also have introduced a few threads from attar hafez and perhaps other oriental poets weaving the whole together with much that is purely his own upon the city towers the sun hath cast a net of lights into the deep cup of day he pours red wine arise and a drink the herald of the dawning cries aloud at sunrise from the wine shop came a call wake jolly comrades of the tavern bench and fill another cup ere fate shall come to fill above the brim your cup of life know you why the cock at daybreak so oft repeats his cry only that in the mirror of the morning you shall see how another night of your life unmarked by you hath slipped away now the world is glad with verdure the boughs blossom white as the hand of moses and flowers bloom as though every breeze that wooed them were the breath of jesus wert thou wise as aristotle or great as caesar of rome or a monarch of cathay drink drink i would bid thee in the cup of jamshid for the grave is the end of all yea wert thou bahram himself the tomb is thy last home it is a pleasant day and neither too hot nor too cold the dew hath washed the dust from the face of the roses the nightingale in the pelevi tongue cries ever to the yellow rose drink wine red wine a passionate nightingale flitting through the garden beholding the roses smiling and the cup filled with wine sang in mine ear forget not friend life is on the wing and comes not back since life flies what difference whether it flies in nashapur or babylon since the cup must be drained why ask whether it be sweet or bitter drink wine for often after you and i are dust yon moon shall wax and wane see the robe of the rose is torn by the breeze the nightingale rejoices in the beauty of the rose sit thou in the shade of the rose tree for by the wind ere this have many roses been scattered to become dust of earth 
It is dawn. Beloved, sing your song and drink your wine, for the long array of months hath overthrown a thousand kings like Jamshid and Kai Khosru. While still a mortal frame is yours, be firm within the fortress of your fate. Yield naught, although your foe be Rustam, son of Zal. Ask no enslaving boon, although your friend be Hatim Tai himself. We that have preferred a corner and two loaves to all the world, we that have put aside all greed of wealth and its magnificence, we that through poverty have cherished heart and soul, in poverty have we found great riches. I desire a little ruby wine and a book of verses, with half a loaf of bread, just enough to nourish me, and then that thou and I should sit in the wilderness is better than the kingdom of a sultan. Blame me who will, but yet, when in the spring, I sit in the meadow beside a loved one, beautiful as a houri, with a flask of rich wine, may I be held lower than a dog if ever I dream of paradise. That paradise is pleasant to the blessed, they say. That the juice of the grape is pleasant to me, I know. Hold fast to this cash, and let that credit go, for the drum-beat, O oh brother, is pleasant from afar. I know not whether my Maker ordained that I should dwell in heaven or in dreadful hell, but a little food, an adored one, a lute and wine upon the green border of a pleasant land, these are cash to me, thine be the credit, heaven. Said the rose, I am the flower of Joseph, for my mouth is full of gold. Said I, If thou art indeed the flower of Joseph, show me another sign thereof. And she replied, Am I not arrayed in a blood-stained garment? Before fate seizes thee, bid them bring thee rose-hued wine. O thoughtless one, thou art not made of gold, that they that hide thee in earth shall dig thee up again. What profits our coming and our going? Of what stuff is woven the fabric of our life? How many delicate forms the world burns to dust of ashes, and where is even the smoke of them? This ancient inn men call the world, where night and day alternate bide, sets forth a stale banquet at which have sat a hundred jamshids, prepares a couch whereon have slept a hundred bahrams, the palace in which Bahram delighted to carouse is become the haunt of deer, the lair of lions. See how this Bahram, that loved to catch the wild ass with a noose, is himself in turn ensnared by the tomb. Wherever blooms a rose or tulip bed, there has been spilled the crimson lifeblood of a king. Each violet tuft that grows from out the earth was once a mole upon the cheek of a fair one. How bright are the green herbs that fringe the stream! Trample them not in scorn, for they spring from the lip of beauty, from the dust of a tulip-tinted face they grow. Come hither, beloved, let us forget to-day and to-morrow, and steal this present hour. To-morrow, when we shall have abandoned this old caravansaray, our old companions shall be all who have departed hence in seven thousand years. Grim fate, even from the beginning of things, foredoomed all to death and destruction. How many of the wise, the great and the noble, are already sleeping deep in the bosom of earth? Down from the clouds, upon the sward, patters life-giving rain. How could I live without the shower of crimson wine? Delightful to me is the grass, but who are they that will delight in the grass that shall spring from my dust? Then let not sorrow afflict thee, nor idle grief burden thy days. Forsake not the book, the loved one's lips, and the green bank of the field, until earth take thee to her bosom. Some ponder creeds and dogmas, some waver betwixt doubt and faith, when suddenly the watcher cries, Fools, your road lies neither here nor there. These great sages, 
the chosen of earth, whose bold thoughts dare the heights of heaven, who would attain the utmost of divine wisdom, at the last are baffled, dazed, and dumb. Like a hawk I soared from this world of mysteries in the hope of reaching a higher sphere, but finding no guide thither, I sank to earth again. I flew out by the door through which I came. For a while, when young, I sat at the feet of a teacher. For a while I was satisfied with my lessons. But what was the outcome of all study? We came in like the water, and we depart like the wind. Like the water of a great river, like the wind of the desert, another day passes out of my allotted life. Grief has never lingered in my mind as to two days, the day that has not come, and the day that has gone. I had naught to do with my coming here. My unwilling departure hence is fixed by fate. Then gird thee to serve, O light-handed cup-bearer, for I will drown the misery of a world in wine. From the zenith of Saturn down to the depth of earth, I solved all problems of the universe. I loosed myself from the bonds of ignorance and lies. Yea, all secrets I unlocked save the great secret of death. That secret of eternity is far from thee and me. The key of that enigma is hid from thee and me. Behind the veil, perchance, is speech of thee and me. But when the veil is rent, what then of thee and me? Thou askest the meaning of this fantastic life. To tell thee would be an endless task. It is a painted mirage arising from a shoreless ocean to sink again into the deep from which it came. O oh, thou, whom all creation seeketh in madness and despair, nor piety nor wealth to thee have found a way. Thy name is in the mouths of all, but all are deaf. Thou art before the eyes of all, but all are blind. Seeking the secret of life, in strong desire I pressed my lip to the lip of the wine-jar, and with its lip clinging to mine, the jar whispered, Drink wine, for to this world thou shalt not return. This jug was once a sighing lover, even as I, wooing a maid of comely face. The handle that thou seest on its neck was once a loving arm that lay upon the neck of a beloved. I saw a potter in the bazaar yesterday pounding the fresh clay, and the clay said to him, in mystic speech, Treat me gently, once was I like to thee. Last night I smote my wine-cup on a stone, dazed was my brain that I did so base a thing. To me, in mystic speech, that goblet said, I was like thee, thou wilt be like to me. The skilful potters that ever knead the clay, how long will they so beat and trample it? Do they never think that this maltreated earth is that of which their fellow men were made? Each draught that the cup-bearer lets fall upon the ground quenches the grief in the eye of some afflicted one. Praise be to God that the juice of the grape can free the heart from a hundred pains. Copy the tulip that flames with the new year. Like her, taking the cup in your hand, light of heart, drink wine with the beauty of tulip cheeks, for you know not when the blue wheel above may dash you down. Limit thy desire for worldly things, and live content. Sever the bonds of thy dependence upon the good and bad of life. Lift the wine cup, and play with the curls of thy beloved, for quickly all passes. How many such days remain? Arise, and give me wine. What time is this for words? For tonight thy little mouth fills all my need. Give me wine, rose-tinted as thy cheeks, for my penitence is as full of tangles as thy curls. Kayam, if thou art mellow with wine, be happy. If beside thee is one of tulip cheeks, be happy. Since at the end of all things thou wilt be naught, 
Yet while thou art, imagine thou art not, and be happy. Hidden in the heavens is a cup whence all must drink in turn. When thy turn comes, do not lament, quaff it unfearing. I am not one that fears death, for that half of my lot seems pleasanter to me than this. The life which has been lent me, that I shall repay whenever the day of repayment comes. Soul, if thou art able to free thyself from clay, and soar, a chainless spirit, through the heavens, shame on thee that thou canst leave that lofty sphere, to dwell again in clay. Kayam, thy body is a tent, thy soul thereof is a sultan whose last home is nothingness. When the sultan quits his pavilion, the grim body servant, death, strikes the tent to set it up again at another stage of the journey. O Kayam, the tent of heaven hides secrets from thee. And yet thou knowest that the eternal cupbearer has poured into the bowl of creation a million bubbles like unto thee. Long years will follow after we have passed the veil of the secrets of God, and still the world will bide, though of us remains no trace. The world knew no lack of us before our coming. It will be in no wise altered by our going. Mysteriously, this caravan of life goes on its way. Seize, then, the happy flying moment. Cup-bearer, why grieve about the to-morrow of thy patrons? Give me a cup of wine, for the night wanes. Only a breath divides faith and unbelief. Only a breath divides certainty and doubt. Let us make merry while we yet draw breath, for only a breath divides life and death. Now thou art hidden, evident to none. Now thou art manifest in all created things. For thine own delight these marvels are performed by thee, who art at once the player and the looker-on. Could we know the secrets of life, we should, knowing death, know likewise the secrets of God. But if to-day, when you are yourself, you know nothing, to-morrow, when stripped of self, what shall you know? Where is the end of eternity to come, and where the beginning of eternity past? Now is the time of joy, and naught can take the place of wine. Rule and method are now far beyond me, but wine unravels the tangles of every problem. I will pour out a full bumper of wine, nay, two cups will content me, and I will three times divorce from me dogma and reason, and wed the daughter of the vine. I have taken the measure of existence and non-existence. I have fathomed the inwardness of all, both high and low. Yet I shall be modest as to my knowledge, for it is naught to the insight given by wine. Since the wheel of heaven and fate have never befriended you, why care whether the heavens be seven or eight? Two days there are for which I take no thought, the day which has not come, and the day that has gone for ever. Last night, in the tavern, a dear friend held out a cup and bade me drink of it. I will not drink, I said, but still he urged, drink for my love's sake. Drink wine that will allay thy many woes, that will banish all the clamour of the two and seventy sects. Renounce not the wonder-worker, since one draught of him can drive away a thousand sorrows. Drink wine, and thou shalt reign like Sultan Mahmud, and hear music sweeter than the harp of David. Enjoy to-day, give no thought to yesterday nor to-morrow, and thy life shall not be lived in vain. Hast thou planted in our hearts an overwhelming desire, which thou hast forbidden us to satisfy? How sad a plight is thine, unhappy man, as though thou wert bidden to turn down a cup without spilling it. O heart, the mystic secret shalt thou not attain, the riddles of the sages shall not be solved by thee. Make thyself a present heaven with wine and cup, for at that place where heaven is thou mayest arrive, or not. 
Drink wine, for long shalt thou sleep within the mould, with neither comrade, friend, or wife. Whisper to none this mighty secret. Tulips once withered will never bloom again. Of all that have set forth upon the long road, who has returned that I may ask him tidings? My friends, leave naught undone in hope of better things, for be sure that you likewise will not come back. Even those who for wit and learning are styled torch-bearers of men, have not made one step into that profound night, they have but told us their dreams, and have fallen to sleep again. At creation's dawn, my soul, beyond the bounds of space, searched for tablet and pen, for heaven and hell. At last the master said to me, Tablet and pen, hell and heaven, are within thyself. The sweep of sky is but an imprisoning mantle of my weary frame. The oxus is the river of my tears. Hell is a fire kindled by my profitless griefs. Paradise is the moment when I am at rest. This heavenly vault, neath which we stand, bewildered, we know to be a sort of magic lantern. The sun is the flame, the universe is the lamp. We are the revolving figures. No parable, but plain truth it is to say that we are chessmen, heaven plays the game, moving us across the chequered squares of life, and one by one replacing us in the box of nothingness. Thou, driven like a ball by the mallet of fate, whether played to the right or left, drink wine, say little, for he that flung thee down into the melee, he knows, he knows. He knows. He. O oh, heart, since this world's truth itself is illusion, why vex thyself with its cares and sorrows? Trust to fate, bear equally all things, for what the pen has written it will not change for thee. The good and bad that are a part of man, his predestined joys and griefs, charge them not to the rolling heavens, for those heavens are a thousandfold more helpless than thou art. Heaven is an overturned bowl, and the wise are helpless prisoners beneath it. But the cup and the jar are fast friends as we should be. They are lip to lip, though blood has been spilt between them. At the beginning was written what shall be, unfaltering the pen writes, heedless whether the writing be of good or evil. On that first day he appointed all that must be. Our griefs and strivings are alike in vain. Be happy! Yesterday they settled thy reward, and yesterday is beyond the reach of thy longings. Live happily, for at no wish of thine yesterday they fixed what thou shalt do to-morrow. Quitting this life you shall pass behind the curtain, the veil that hides heaven's secrets. Drink wine, for you know not whence you come. Be merry, for you know not whither you go. That day when the horses of the stars were harnessed, and the Pleiades were lighted, on that day the divan of fate decreed our lot. How then shall we be held to account, since our course is that which has been traced for us? O learned fanatic of the town, though I be mellow with wine, yet am I better than thou. For thou drinkest the blood of men, and I the blood of the vine. In justice, say which is the more cruel. If I whisper thee my secret thought in a tavern, better it is than formal prayer before the shrine, where thou art not. O thou, first and last of all beings, burn me or cherish me as thou wilt. When God moulded my frame of clay, he knew beforehand what my deeds would be. It is not then in defiance of his will that I have sinned. Why then should I burn in hell? Can I be a rebel, when thy will is omnipotent? Is my heart dark, when thou art Lord of light? If thou bestowest heaven only in return for obedience, it is a debt thou payest, and where then is thy mercy? In my path thou settest a thousand snares, saying, 
death to thee if thou plant foot therein. Thou orderest all things in this world, and yet they say I do not according to thy desire. Know of the secret heart of every man, thou that in the hour of weakness upholdest the faltering. Accept, O Lord, my penitence, and give me strength, thou that givest repentance, and acceptest the excuses of all. I passed the potter's house, and saw the craftsman busy at his wheel, turning out pots and jars, fashioning them from the moulded heads of kings and feet of beggars. Who can believe that he who made the cup would dream of destroying it? All these fair faces and delicate feet wrought with his fingertips. For love of whom did he make them? For hate of whom would he break them? Thou that rulest the fate of living and dead, that governest the wheel of heaven with thy hand, if I am sinful, am I not thy creature? Art thou not master of all? To whom shall be the blame? Yesterday I went to the workshop of the potter, where I saw two thousand pots, some speaking, others silent. Suddenly cried out a querulous one, Where is the potter, the seller, the buyer of pots? They say that on the last day will be a judgment, and that the beloved friend will be angry. But from eternal goodness naught but good can come. Fear not, therefore, thou shalt find mercy at the last. When I lie beneath the foot of fate, when my tree of life is uprooted, see that thou make only a goblet of my clay. Haply, when it is full of wine, I may revive. Ramazan, month of fasting, passes, and the new moon of Shawwal, season of feasting joy and song, is in the sky. Now comes the cry, wine skins up, and the porters come, shoulder to shoulder, bearing the bottles. Comrades, give me wine, to make these amber cheeks glow like the ruby. And when I die, wash me in wine, and frame my coffin from the wood of the vine. I would fain drink so deep, that the perfume of the wine shall exhale from my tomb, and mellow revellers in passing shall be overcome by the rich fragrance. In the tavern one can wash only in wine, and the name there soiled cannot thus be cleansed. Therefore bring more wine, for my robe of honour is spoiled beyond repair. Each morn, I say, this night I shall repent, repent me of the flagon and the brimming bowl. But now that the season of roses hath come to free me from repentance, let me, O Lord, repent my repentance. Though wine has soiled my robe of honour, so long as I live I will not abjure wine. I am in grave doubt concerning vintners, for what can they buy better than what they sell? Alas, the scroll of my youth is rolled up, the springtime of our pleasures is o'er, and that sweet bird, whose name is youth, has flown. It came, I know not whence, and whither it goes, I know not. Oh, that there were a place to rest, and that we might find the straight road thither! Oh, that after a hundred thousand years we might rise from earth's bosom like the new grass! I wish that now, before mine eyes, God would rebuild the world anew. I wish that he would either blot my name from the roll of life, or make my life more fair. Were I master of the heavens, I would sweep all away and fashion new skies, beneath which free man might win his heart's desire. Since none may assure thee to-morrow, make happy thy burdened heart to-day. Drink wine in the moonlight, fair moon of my soul, for in days to come heaven's moon shall seek us long, but shall not find us. Comrades, when ye gather here, delighting in revelry, as the cupbearer passes the mark wine, remember one who will be absent. Friends, at your joyous meeting, drinking the rich wine together, when the flagon comes to the place that was mine, Turn down a cup. The End End of Section 3